Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I, of course, am your host, Chris Broussard. We've got another dynamic show for you. Our interview is with longtime Celtics play-by-play man, Mike Gorman. He's been 37 years with the team. He's got some fantastic stories for you about Larry Bird, Paul Pierce, all the way up to Kyrie Irving. So a great listen. You definitely want to check it out. We got my man, Jason McIntyre, here for another exciting, fun, even comical episode of Knockdown J. But of course, we start things off, as always, with the top five. Now, talking to Mike Gorman made me think about, hmm, who are the best Celtics, the best five Celtics of all time? And man, like the Lakers, this is a tough one because it's such a wonderful, successful franchise full of championships full of hall of famers so i left off some all-time greats paul pierce i'm sorry i I mean come on it's the celtics i I hate leaving you off but who do i take off my top five kevin McHale, one of the greatest power forwards of all time he also did not make the list it was tough but i had to go with that number five dave cowens people forget about dave cowens Dave Cowens was nice. He was an undersized center, just six foot nine in a league of giants in the 70s, but he was fantastic. This guy was rookie of the year. He was MVP one season. He was all-star game MVP. He led the Celtics along with John Havlicek to two titles in 1974 and 1976. And in 1974, he averaged 23 points and 10 rebounds against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the Celtics beat the Bucks, who also had Oscar Robertson, though he was older, in the finals. They beat him in seven with Cowens leading the way 23 and 10 against Kareem. Got to give him number five. Just crazy accomplishments. At number four, John Havlicek. The Celtics' all-time leading scorer with more than 26,000 points. But he was more than a scorer. He also got it done on the defensive end. He had endless amounts of energy, played with incredible hustle, and made eight, count them, eight all-defensive teams. There's something else about eight. He won eight championships. Seems crazy today, but he was always holding up the championship trophy. He averaged 20 points, six rebounds, five assists across his 16 year career, a top 50 player of all time, like everybody on this list, John Havlicek, number four. At number three, you know the legend, Bob Cousy. Cousy was the league's first great point guard and showman. That position has had tons of flashy players, but Cousy was the first. He was the first with the behind the back dribble, the spin dribble, the behind the back pass, the no look pass. Cousy was dynamic as a player. He averaged 18 points, eight assists across his career, led the NBA in assists eight straight season, and won six championships. Six. That equals Michael Jordan. At number two, Larry Bird. Of course, in the 1980s, he resurrected the NBA along with Magic Johnson. He is one of the greatest shooters and passers of all time. Here's how good Bird was. The year before he got there, the Celtics won 29 games. His rookie year, they won 61. Bird was absolutely phenomenal. He's one of three players, along with Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell, to win three straight MVP awards. He won three championships, and here's some players on the list of guys he beat in the NBA Finals. Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Moses Malone, Hakeem Olajuwon, Ralph Sampson. Bird number two. And at number one, Bill Russell. Look, this guy played 13 years in the NBA and won 11 championships. I mean, we can't even imagine anybody doing that nowadays. And for three years, he was the Celtics player coach and won two championships in those years. And it's not like he wasn't playing against anybody. Wilt Chamberlain, Oscar Robertson, you had some great players in that era, but Russell dominated. 
He only averaged 15 points a game, so you don't hear a lot about him as being the greatest player of all time. But when it came to championships, he is the hands down winner, not only in basketball, but in all American sports. Here's how respected Bill Russell was. In 1961-62, that season, Wilt Chamberlain averaged 50 points a game, 26, almost 26 rebounds a game. Oscar Robertson averaged a triple-double, and Bill Russell was the MVP. That's crazy. That was one of five MVP awards he won, same as Michael Jordan, and one fewer than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Bill Russell, hands down, the greatest Celtic of all time. Now, I got to say this. I, I know you're going to shoot at me for leaving off Paul Pierce, maybe Kevin McHale. There were some tremendous Celtics I hated to leave off, but it is what it is. It's a great franchise. All right, we're back with another segment of Knockdown J. You feeling all right? My man, look. You nervous? Nah, look. After I, last week's beating. I, I know I mess with you a lot. <laughs> you know, I knock down J. I tease you, all that stuff. But I respect yeah. your perseverance, your determination. Okay. Your stick to itiveness. Ooh. The fact that you're like Dwayne Wade in the old commercials. You keep getting knocked down, and you keep getting up. <laughs> hey, by the way, you know who else likes it? The YouTube commenters out there. I was telling the producer, I read the comments. Yes. They're starting to swing to my side, Chris. So I step up your game far. today. I wouldn't go that far. All right, far. okay. They're, they're starting not to dislike you as much as they used to. <laughs> All right, but let if me, you uh, want to say that's your side, then so okay. be it. Let's get started with this one, Chris. The All-NBA teams were nearing the end of the season, and the center position looks locked. Right, Joel Embiid, the power forward, Anthony Davis, the other forward, LeBron. The because guard because of injuries, yeah. yeah with the guard situation is up in the air. We know James Harden's got one guard position, which leaves, I believe, two people. Well, Steph is Steph is injuries. injuries, but I believe it's between Damian Lillard and Russell Westbrook. I mean, Damian Lillard's been off the hook. That's my pick for first team All NBA. Mm -hmm. I go Lillard over Westbrook. I mean you got to start with third in the West. Okay, 13-game winning streak now. I believe they have the Rockets up next. Lillard is a legitimate MVP candidate, one of the most clutch players in the league. I know his numbers aren't up significantly from last year, but in a loaded West, absolutely loaded, he has outperformed the Thunder significantly. Nobody had Portland ahead of OKC at this stage in the game, but in the preseason. I go Damian Lillard over Russell Westbrook for the guard position All-NBA. Look, Lillard has been phenomenal. I think I'm glad he's starting to get the love he deserves. There are a few years, last few years, he didn't even make the All-Star team. Unbelievable. It's tough. Well, the West is so deep, but, you know, I, I, he's having a phenomenal season, and if he ends up being first-team All-NBA, I'm not going to be upset. I mean, he's certainly deserving and playing You almost sound like you're going to lean Westbrook here. But, uh, well, I, I'm going Westbrook. I mean, what people don't understand is Westbrook is essentially averaging another triple-double, okay? 25 points a game, that's one fewer than Lillard. 10 assists a game, that's the best in the league. Pick all your pass first point guards. Pick all your great passing point guards. James Harden, LeBron's a wonderful passer. Chris Paul, you know, John Wall, whoever you want to name. Russell Westbrook is ahead of all of them in assists, and he's four ahead of Lillard. Okay. Lillard, six and a half assists a game, not that great, all right, for a point guard. Then Russ is giving me 9.7 rebounds a game. Solid. So if we could round up, this dude is averaging another triple-double. We've got, It's kind of like LeBron. We've gotten so used to LeBron's greatness that we just – Oh, he had 37 and 7 we're, again. We're, we're we take it for granted. Are you sure you want to yeah, mention I'm sure. Russell I'm, I, Westbrook oh, yeah. in the same sentence Yeah, I'm sure LeBron. because at the end of the day, they will both be in the same Hall of Fame. And Russell As will Westbrook, Damian Lillard. Ru well, we'll see. Russell Westbrook, Russell Westbrook <laughs> is averaging a triple-double essentially for the second straight year, something we never thought we'd see right. anyone else do. And since you think Westbrook's nothing but a gunner, a volume shooter, right. guess what? He's shooting a higher percentage than Damian from Lillard. From the field, right. Lillard is 44% from the floor. Damian, or Russell Westbrook is 45% right, from, from the floor. What about from three-point percentage? Let me, let me, three-point percentage, Chris. That's not the only oh, yeah, shot. Oh, yeah, that doesn't matter. Okay, No, it. it matters, but well, it's but not the only shot. just tell everybody what he is from deep. 
28%. He's not a three-point shooter. He's 28%. Damian so what? Lillard, Neither 37. Neither is Giannis Kumbo. You don't like him? Now ben Simmons hasn't made it's a three. Ben, that's a knock on his game. That's right. Three point. I'm not just about the three because there's other parts of the game. But you're about the rebounds for Russell Westbrook. Yeah, of okay, course. continue. I don't want to interrupt you. It's a triple-double. Yeah. Beyond that, Russell Westbrook, since in December, we know in the first month and a half of the season, he was deferring to mm-hmm. his new players, Paul George, Melo. He was giving them involved, getting the ball. In December, everybody in OKC said, Russ, be Russ. He started being Russ, started averaging about a triple-double, and they have gone 35-17. and 17. That's, That's a 55-win pace since then. And they're only a game and a half behind Portland. Okay. There is time for them to catch the Warriors or the, the Blazers and finish third in the West. Look, I love Lillard, but without question, Russell Westbrook is first team all NBA. Oh, wow. It's not okay. look, Lillard, he's doing great in March, yeah, yeah. right? Twenty nine points well, a game. February, everybody's ra- everybody's raving about what he's doing in, in you're right, February yeah. was Since great. Since February first. Anthony Davis is first in the league in scoring. Damian Lillard is second. Guess what Damian Lillard is shooting from the floor in March? Go ahead and tell me. 40%. Okay. Russell Westbrook is shooting over 50%. That's great. In March. Okay. So, come on, man. I slaughtered you. Oh, wait, 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 we're not done. Wait a sec. We're not even Where's close to finish. Ring? We're not Kiss even close to mug. finish. We're not Kiss even that mug. We're not close to finish. I got the stats for you on clutch time, which is where Damian Lillard shows up. He's the most clutch oh, player. Oh, Westbrook doesn't? I would say Damian Lillard's the most clutch player in the league. Okay. Why Since would you say his that? rookie year, final minute. To tie or go ahead, Lillard has the most baskets in clutch time. Number one over LeBron, over Russell Westbrook. Number one. First of all, that has, has, has Russell this Westbrook year, this won. year. This is all NBA 2017-18. Okay. I don't want to hear about you what he did five clutches, years but ago. You wanted to tell what me all about do? Russell Westbrook's What's triple double last now? year, like that mattered. No, okay. I was talking about this year. When was the last time Russell Westbrook took a team in the playoffs and won by himself? Without any help. Well, he's only had one yeah, year. Yeah, and that. what happened? And bounced in the first round. What did Damian Lillard do? Oh, so C.J. McCollum is, is Anthony good, Robertson? He's a good player. He's a 20-something oh, he's not point Anthony scorer. Anthony Robertson. Stop. That's disrespectful. Okay, no, C.J. McCollum's a good point, player. player. I know. That's what I'm saying. He's don't, a distant don't second Don't tell me that Damian's doing it by himself when, when he's got C.J. McCollum there. Oh, so now we're dis- – so, so Paul George is chopped liver? No, Paul George you, Carmelo but you Anthony, asked me. Who you love to say is a Hall of Famer? The Thunder have a better <laughs> roster, no doubt. Your arguments are all over the place. Well, that's you, because I'm responding you, to your nonsense. You Chris. asked me. You asked me when was the last time Russell Westbrook went to the playoffs by himself right. and won a round. He's only had one chance. Yes, last and year he failed. Miserably. So Paul George was not there that's fair. last year. Okay. So now all of a sudden you threw George in it. No, no, I'm not talking about George. I'm talking fine. about what he had last year. He did not have the equivalent of a CJ McCollum last year. Fair enough. That's totally fair. Who has a better roster this year? OKC or Portland? Don't even I'll think. Say OKC. Without question, Stephen Adams is one of the best post players in the league. Yeah. Well, Nurk Paul George. Is too. Paul George is a superstar. Star. And Carmelo Anthony's a Hall of Famer. Yes, but an old Hall of Fame. Portland does not have anything close to that. Portland's ahead in the standings because of Damian Lillard. Game, set, match. Let's toss They're it to They're a game tour. and a half. Uh, you, want, you want to say anything else? No, before? I'm just saying. You rest it's your a game case. and a half. The race is close. <laughs> you, okay. Yeah, he doesn't have to say anything else because I got to go with Bruce Sardis. Oh! I'm Thank sorry. You. You, Numbers don't so lie. Good. Look, yeah. no disrespect to video game Dave. He's phenomenal. But Russ, come on. He just ended, what, he had his fifth consecutive triple-double, third such streak. I mean, he's just going off. And he uh, ended the Raptors' 11-game win streak yes. with absurd numbers and 68.2% shooting, Preach. I believe it was, Preach. in that game. Yeah, so I rest my case. Dang, man. Humbled. You all right? The Russell Westbrook. She actually the went Russ, oh, She didn't just say Bruce Westbrook Westbrook fans. She I, actually I, I can't added to my argument. All over FS1. It's like you. It. It's Nick Wright. Tor. Everybody <laughs> loves Russell Westbrook. Well, the, the Russell hold Westbrook on, hold bandwagon. On. He is. We nev- Did you He's ever good. think you would see a player average a triple-double? I never thought of that. I, it doesn't. Oh, you never thought of that. My mind. Do you watch basketball? I don't you look at stat that? patterns like Russell Westbrook. I'm not a. Oh, he got a triple double. He's a stat pattern. Well, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. Last year, really? we saw it. We saw the videos. Were they His supposed to be His players letting him get rebounds and foul oh, shots. Stop it! Stop Come on, it. we ran that video. He averaged a triple double, and, and he's, they ba- got bounced he's in the basically first round. doing it again. Lonzo Ball's shooting better than from deep. 
Okay, then Russell Wait, Westbrook. you're actually, That's all I you say. got mad at me for putting Westbrook in the same sense with LeBron, and now you're putting Lonzo in the same no, sense with Westbrook? I'm just saying, three-point shooting, are you Russell saying, Westbrook are you is saying Lonzo's good. better than Westbrook? No, yeah, that's what I'm, no, man, come on. Like, move on. All right, let's, let's, let's get off a topic that you're more. not strong on. Let's go to another one. <laughs> in the West, Chris, okay, we got two teams suffering injuries. Minnesota Timberwolves lost Jimmy Butler. They were third in the West. They've fallen to eighth. San Antonio Spurs have had Kawhi for nine games. They've fallen to, I believe, seventh in the West right now. Sixth or seventh. Fifth. Pelican, well, we're at fifth, but it's by like half a game or it's something. It's also close, but they're fifth. Okay, they are supposed to come back for the playoffs, both of them. Jimmy Butler wore his jersey this week on the bench under his uh, sport jacket. Kawhi, we know, is... Kawhi, we'll I mean, one Can't network reported he was going to be back last week. I mean, we, still we, haven't we've been... Yeah, exactly. Both players are supposed to come back for the playoffs. Who's more dangerous in the postseason... Timberwolves with Butler, Spurs with Kawhi. And I'm going to go with the Timberwolves with Jimmy Butler. Because when he was on the court, he was their clutch player. He was their best defender. I know Jeff Teague missed a lot of time, but that team with Wiggins, Towns, Butler, Teague, Jamal Crawford off the bench, they were gelling. They were third in the West. The Spurs, this is an old team. From Manu at 40, LaMarcus is 32, playing out of his mind, but he's, he's 32. Uh, Pau Gasol, 37. Uh, Tony Parker, 35. This is an old roster. I don't see it with the Spurs this year. I think the Wolves are more dangerous They've than Jimmy Butler. They've been an old roster. I have. They were old when they ran circles around the Miami Heat in 2014. <laughs> Tim Duncan was a shell of himself. <laughs> Manu was old then. Tony Parker was, Parker was old then. He was like 31. Yeah, but he had been in the league since he was 19. Yeah. I mean. 35 is different. There was, the injury look, last I, year. Minnesota, Jimmy Butler has been great this year. Phenomenal. Yeah, he's all been, NBA level. We'll see. I mean, well, it's, I think he's it's tough. It's fifteen players, but he, he's certainly been at that level, no question. But if you're asking me in the playoffs, yes, who I'm going to take between a San Antonio Spurs team coached by Greg Popovich and a young Minnesota team, I have to go with Pop and the Spurs. Five championships for mm-hmm. Pop. I love Tibbs. He's a great coach, but none for Tibbs. Um, then they they have virtually no. Among their best players, Butler's got some playoff experience. He does. But not that deep playoff experience. Correct. Where then Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins, this will be their first trip to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I mean, do I have to even go Jeff through the Teague is Do I have to even go through the list of champions on the Spurs? Well, I Jeff, don't think so. My point LeBron, is yeah. their two second their second and third best players have never mm-hmm. even been in the playoffs. This will be their first trip to the playoffs. The Spurs we know have a ton of experience. They Popovich had them. They were the ones that were third in the West for most of the season Mm -hmm. without Kawhi Leonard, with a roster full of people most people couldn't even name. Mm -hmm. They were ahead of the Timberwolves when Butler was playing for them. Remember, the Spurs have been with – they have a better record than Minnesota. They've been without Kawhi for all but nine games. Yes. The, The Timberwolves have only been without Butler for like, a handful, but a that's dozen why games. I love of, the Timberwolves. But that's my, my point is that. There's not going to be this whole new incorporation of Butler because they played with him for 50 games. Kawhi, okay. You LaMarcus, think it's going to be hard on, for them to work Kawhi LaMarcus in? Aldridge is the number one option on that team this year. When Kawhi comes back, who's the number one option? Kawhi well, Leonard. Kawhi. Exactly. Now, he has, he's gone the entire season not playing. He's got to mesh with the new point guard, Murray, who has, he hasn't played a lot with this year. Nine games. I just think it's going to be tough to jam it all together Here's for the, the playoffs when Kawhi hasn't been there all year. And, hold on, the cloud hovering over Kawhi. Is he going to get the Supermax offer? Does he want to stay in San Antonio, beef with the organization? Well, just what about lot- Andrew Wiggins? Andrew Wiggins did raise a beef. He's uh, not that, happy being the third option. He, that, that, oh, that that's a that's, considerable that's gonna thing. Hover. That's that could hover, hover, but right? he can't do anything. He just got a huge it, it's contract. It's gonna hover. He got it's a huge hover. contract. It does not hover. <laughs> but look, he, like you know Kawhi. what will hover even more? The fact that Minnesota, unbelievably, I never thought I'd say this about a Tom Thibodeau team, doesn't play yeah, defense. That, that sickens me. They're yes. 26th in the league in defense. Guess where the Spurs are? Top 10. Top two. Yes. All right. What matters in the playoffs? Defense. Defense. Yeah, you, the Rockets found that the out Spur, last year. The, the Spurs will have the best player. Kawhi is better than Butler. The uh, Spurs. Okay. Oh, hold on. Right, oh, yeah, the Spurs better. will have the best player. I had to give they some will thought. have the best coach. coach. They will have the best defense. Case closed. Ooh, that's a they fair, will have the experience. That's a fair argument. I, I disagree completely. Tori. Look. 
I don't want you to take this personal, but the Spurs are always old, they're always boring, and they're always a problem. Spurs fan. No, you, she's, Tori, are you, she's speaking Tori, facts. Born in, born Do in not disrespect Tori. Tori born in San Antonio. Well, I've only biased. played 210 minutes this season. I get it. But he's that guy. You put him back in, pop in the postseason. I'm sorry, I gotta go Bruce Hart again. I actually think this Tori is... should be arguing these things. <laughs> oh my god. She's giving better arguments than me. There, there's no argument. She's on your side. No, I mean, right. Let's move on to another topic you sure? I can win. Are you sure? Another topic I can win. Are you win. sure? This one's silly. Okay, we came up with like this at the said, last minute. Perseverance, we're determination. Sitting here, we're getting we're, stick we're just sitting this. here rapping, and all of a sudden Broussard says, Which rather would which roster would you rather have? 76ers or Lakers? And it took me, what, half a second? Lakers, I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, where, where do you want to start? They, they've got Lonzo Ball, the point guard of the future, on the, on the organization. Yeah, they got and, Brandon uh, Ingram. I've got Ben Simmons. Yeah, but you, you'll have your time. Patience, okay? I mean, you, you, you really trying <laughs> to argue Lonzo Grasshopper. Ball? I said we got Simmons? Lonzo Ball, past first point guard, who I love. Brandon Ingram, what is he, 20, 21 years old, just scratching the surface. Kyle Kuzma, absolute steal in the draft. And then this is my favorite part, Chris. Magic and the Lakers signed a bunch of one-year contracts. Brooke Lopez, KCP. They don't have to stick around. Lakers have flexibility. Uh-uh, uh-uh. The, the question was roster right yeah. now. Roster Not right now. That's LeBron why I love it. George. I didn't say with them. Right now. But that's but what, what I love. talking about flexibility. Well, that's what you want in a roster. Flexibility. You don't want to be hamstrung Philly's with bad long contracts. Philly's going to have room, too. They will. They're not hamstrung. But I've got Lonzo, Ingram, and Kuzma. You've only got Embiid and uh, Sarich and Simmons. I, I love it. this Lakers Look, I am I mean, willing, unless, unless I you're going to talk about Markel Fultz, I can't wait for you to bring I that guy I am ready up. to say with absolute certainty, certainty. Okay, let's hear it. That if Philadelphia's players, and it goes the same thing for the Lakers, let's say all these players, Philly and Lakers, stay healthy. Ben Simmons. Love him. And Joel Embiid will be all-time greats. I don't doubt that. That's not a... There is not they were one number player. one overall pick. Now, you got, some, you got some players on the some? Lakers that are going to be good. Lakers have 31 let, wins in the much better West. Let me finish. Versus 39 for Philly. Let's not act like the 76ers are world beaters here, okay? I like Simmons and Embiid. Well, when Embiid... 39 wins in the East. Embiid missed 11 games. They were 3-8. Well, and eight. How many games Lando missed? When how many it, games Ingram missed? Like, we can when, play no, that game all you saying, want. No, what I'm saying, when Embiid's healthy, they're on a 50-win pace. Certainly. Okay. Here's the thing. Lonzo, will he be an all-star? Maybe. No, maybe. I mean, remember, he's in the West. I mean, Russell Westbrook's still relatively young. Damian Lillard, C.J. McCollum, Stephen Clay. I mean, I'm just saying, it's tough in the West. Lonzo's not playing well. He is shooting so better from deep than Russell Westbrook. I'm saying is he's not a guaranteed but, yeah. all-star, let alone a Nobody's guaranteed. all-time Nothing great. Nothing is guaranteed. Simmons and Embiid are going to be all-time greats well, if they ass- stay healthy. Assuming health. Lonzo... I don't. I, I'm not willing to say he's definitely going to be an all-time great. No. Brandon Ingram definitely going to be an all-time we great. We don't know that. No. No. Kyle Kuzma. No. no Julius no. Randle. No. There's not one Julius player Ra- on that. No, I didn't roster. even bother mentioning. There's Randall. not one player on the Lakers roster that you know is going to but be an all-time great. But that goes to your question. The roster. I look at it. That's what I'm saying. That guy I, ain't going to be here next year. That guy's not going to be here next year. Flexibility. I can Isaiah say the Thomas. Same. Look, so you no, 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 you can't. You got to talk about the players you have you, right now. You guys now. just signed Robert Covington to a long. Yeah, day. I love Covington. Where do you with love him? What number is he He's on the Sixers three roster? And D player. What, go down the Sixers roster. Where is he? Tell me what on the you, roster. What do you Embiid mean? is one. Simmons is two. Who's three? Is Covington your third best player? Right now, better he than Sarich. He's better. I take. Is he better than Fultz? What Foles we haven't yeah. seen. I Foles. would take Kyle Kuzma over Robert Covington. I if you're would going take, one, hold on. one to one, I two to two, take, three, three. I would take Simmons and Embiid over, over Lonzo any and Ingram. Big three. No, big three. You no, got no, two to two. No, I'm saying you said roster. We're looking at the whole roster. Not, you don't do a roster by that way. Who's a better team? Who fits better I, together? I, I like and I, I have, like flexibility I have, and youth. I, I didn't give Joel Embiid. I don't Embiid. have youth. I don't have flexibility. How much money? About? How much money did they, they got enough need? money to offer LeBron a they, max? They got yeah, one on one max. They Lakers. only need one. Lakers can do two. Because I got two all time greats in the future. Potential. I don't need two max players. Potential all time greats. You're talking about right now it's roster. It's all about potential. Right now. Yeah, potential for the roster. Look, they have flexibility. Look, look, look. I have got. Uh, what are you arguing? I have got. I have got. Uh, uh, the um. The closest thing we've ever seen to Magic Johnson. I would argue. I would argue. And yes, then I've got the closest thing in the league right now 
to a, a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar type dominant center. Well, yeah. There's no other. Much. I love no, I'm not he's saying he's Kareem. NBA. I'm just saying there is no other dominant back to the basket center who can score on you, mm-hmm. put 40 on you if he wants to, has that dog nasty mentality. There's no other center like that in the NBA. Maybe Carl Anthony Towns, but he's not as strong and big as Embiid is. So now I've got the building blocks, a great point guard and a great center. Those are typically the building blocks. That was Shaq and Kobe, I guard, agree, but, center. But Chris, that was Dwayne the... Wade and Shaq, guard, center. But when you that go... was Magic and Kareem, guard, center. You talking about a bunch of guys who might make some all-star teams. I'm talking no. about two See, dudes that could end up in the Hall of Fame. This is our fundamental difference. When, you, when the question is, which roster would you rather have? To me, that question is, you can be the GM of one of these two teams. You can take the roster that you want, Sixers or Lakers. I take Lakers. Three really good young players. Josh Hart on the side, really nice. Randall's really nice. And guess what? I've got flexibility in the offseason. You're talking roster to build out my roster. No, you can't add two max guys. I don't need two. I got Joel Embiid. I got Ben Simmons. You know what? Forget need. I don't want to. (laughs) I'm serious. I don't want two stars. You can't have but so many stars. Yours needs to be a pecking order. I need one more player. And he don't even have to be a star. So, so he can be a great that, shooter. Think, he can be a 3 and D guy. So based on that, you think Joel Embiid can lead the Sixers as the best player to a title? Yes! Okay. Interesting. And who on the Lakers roster can do it? Well, that's where the Lakers roster's... That's the beauty of it. They <laughs> have the room to bring in that guy. See, and I know you don't you like that. You're about to get kicked off, knockdown. Well, I mean, stop. That's the beauty of it. You, you asked know, me you know what? You know who else don't have it? How about Sacramento? That's a real beautiful they, roster. Yeah, they've got there's guys. nobody on that team that can lead you to a championship. They don't have How about talent? Phoenix? Nobody on that team that's leading now you're just With drunk. all due respect to my man Devin check, Booker. Check that bottle for, uh, is that, is that I mean, what do you, you just said that's the beauty of the roster. You've what got, if you don't get LeBron and George? Then what? You've got the cap room to chase someone else. Oh, and you've got the three youthful building blocks. Three awesome Tory, players Tory. under 22. Oh. Tori. Tori, this is a no-brainer. Were, I mean, Tori, maybe, maybe, not, maybe until you said that. Tori, maybe. tell me you're kidding. I, I just, here's the thing. The Lakers are banking on LeBron. They need no, I didn't say LeBron's name once. I just said they can flex the And in B, they're having fun. They're jiving. They're trusting the process. The most impressive thing to me about the Lakers ro- pro- roster, as it stands right now, is Julius Randle out there looking like Zebo. I, I don't I think there's anything to get oh, fired up about. That that I know. So that's, you didn't even yeah, I don't, I don't need that to. That would have helped your I'm just telling you. Yeah. Level guy, you got to reassess Wait, Tori, on that. Hold on. So if you could be the GM today of the Sixers, <laughs> but I thought we're talking about the roster as it is now. Yeah, that, that's the, what not the about GM's what job, is. job is to shape the roster. I, you would take I just, I think they have a, a brighter future. I think with the pieces you've gotten with play what there, you have now, we're not, thirty-nine wins. Heck, the Sixers might get I mean, LeBron. Yeah, the Sixers might get but Paul George. Again, let me go back to this: thirty-nine wins in the East, and you've already got your two best players, Simmons and Embiid. 31 in the West, they're and you rookies. don't have anything. You just undressed the Lakers roster said, oh, they, we don't know if they're all-stars. And they got 31 wins. That roster, to me, with the cap flexibility, is a no-brainer. How are you not seeing this? Chris, we, this we is a big, have to change this, this is to a knock big, down something else. This is a big hole. And, and get, I mean, I get somebody believe, else on here. I can't believe you're not I, seeing I, this. We're going to have to take this. We're going to do this again. Because this, <laughs> I'm going to have to teach you. This is a no-brainer to me. Dallas young Mavericks. Man, young man, stop talking. Stop talking. <laughs> what could that I do? was it for Knockdown, Jay. We're back and, next we, week. and in the zone in general, we hope you enjoyed it. I know you enjoyed that. I love that. Great comic relief. We're like comic a sick Comic relief. Guy. You know, but but look, go to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud. Then go to the Lakers us, roster and look at it and be like, McIntyre's so right. Give us five stars, leave us a comment, and we will see you next week. I can't believe it. I'm shocked. <laughs> All right, we're excited to have Mike Gorman joining us in the zone. He is the play-by-play man for the Celtics and has been since 1981. That's 37 years for those who don't know the math. We're very honored to have him. You can check him out on Twitter, at Celtics Voice, uh, on Twitter, at Celtics Voice. But, Mike, how you doing? Good, Chris. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, no, we're we're glad to have you. Um, I just... Got done rating my top five Celtics of all time. I'm going to run the list by you and and get your thoughts. Uh, At number five, I've got Dave Cowens. 
At four, John Havlicek. Three, Bob Cousy. Two, Larry Bird. And one, Bill Russell. Uh, no argument. Uh, as much as I love Dave, I might slide Paul Pierce in the head of, head of Dave. But I'll really? give you no argument. Yeah, it was, I mean, obviously, you know, Cowens with the two MV or with the MVP and the two rings, you know, he had more accomplishments. Yeah. But talk to me why you would, you know, uh, put Pierce ahead of him or just Pierce in that top five. And even like, you know, it was Robert Parrish, who I think most of people believe was an overstatement, saying that uh, – Pierce was the best offensive player the Celtics have ever had. But I think someone else said, uh, who was it? A a Celtics legend a few years ago said Pierce is the best scorer or in Celtics. Yeah, Tommy Tommy, That's what I thought. Tommy Heinsohn had said that. Yeah, Tommy said on numerous occasions that if he had the ball with five seconds left in the game and could have it in the hands of one guy, whoever was a Celtic, he'd put it in Paul Pierce's hands. So are so we that's, that's, underestimating Pierce? I mean, those of us who don't see him every night, or talk to talk to me about that. Yeah, I think I think people do underestimate Paul. Paul was I had the pleasure of uh, he's my favorite Celtic of all time uh, because I got a chance to really do his whole career um, back in the early part, first fifteen years or so that I did the Celtics during the eighties. I only did the home games, and then would go do the Big East uh, when the Celtics were on the road. Okay. Um, so I didn't really get to see some of the great performances by that Celtic team on the road in the 80s. Uh, however, I got to do Paul Pierce's whole career, and I saw some remarkable performances by him in times when the Celtics in the 90s were not a good basketball team. Uh, but Paul just went out there every night and was a warrior. Uh, I, I couldn't have been. He was the guy I was happiest for when they won a championship because of all he had done. But uh, I just, I just think Paul's career in total – um, puts him in the top five. He was just, again, a much better player than people gave him credit for. Um, I know when we put together highlight reels for the retirement of his number, uh, some of the dunks that, that Paul threw down over the course of his career, he was just a much more athletic player than people realized, a much bigger player than people realized. One of those guys who, when you saw him walking across the court, because he was just so proportionately built, he didn't look that big, but the closer we got to you, the wider those shoulders got, the bigger he got. Um, so, yeah, again, Dave's a good friend of mine, and, and, and if Dave were in the room right now, he'd be throwing bricks at me. <laughs> um, I, 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 would, uh, I would slide Paul into that fifth spot and come off the bench with Dave. As you said, you saw Paul's whole career. Talk about the growth you saw in him just as a person, you know, from early in his career to – and now he's going to be, uh, if, he, if he already isn't, an ambassador of the, of the league. Yeah, I, uh, it, it, it was really great to watch because I saw a, a young man, a kid, come into the, the system and, and, and leave a man. Uh, and to watch that growth, to see him go through some hard times, to see him have some, make some personal mistakes, which Paul would be the first one to admit along the line. Of course, there was that stabbing incident in Boston yeah. that uh, a lot of people remember in Paul you know, put himself in the wrong place at the wrong time and would be the first one to admit that. But to, I had a chance to MC both a, a dinner for about a hundred people the night before we retired his number and then MC the actual ceremony uh, on the court and to see Paul with his, with his kids now and his wife and, and he's a father and he's, uh, you know, Chrissy, I, I wouldn't have thought Paul was going to be a broadcaster. I, I just didn't think he really necessarily had that in him. But uh, he's really impressed me with what he's done. He's done a terrific job uh, on ESPN with some of the work that he's doing. And um, Yeah, I think, Paul, you're right. Paul's going to become a very good ambassador for this league over the next 10 years. Yeah, I thought he's – I think he's done a great job on TV. I told him – I said, you used to get mad at the media for saying and writing stuff, and now you're a part of it doing the same thing. That's right. (laughs) He was like, I don't care what the (laughs) players think. I'm just going to say what I want to say. (laughs) That's right. What was it, it, Paul, oh, go ahead. Now, what you see is what you get with Paul. That's what I always liked about him. He was right up front. He didn't, he didn't hide anything. Um, again, I think people are going to learn to like him in the coming years as a uh, spokesperson for the NBA and as a broadcaster. What was your take? There was obviously some hubbub about the, cer- the retirement ceremony for his jersey and Ray Allen not being there and all that. What, what's your take on that whole situation? Well, I guess we're going to find out, Chris, when the book comes out, because that's, yeah. that's what everybody's talking about now. Um, yeah, I, 
you know, that was a very interesting team. You know, Kevin Garnett was the dominant personality on that team. And, uh, you know, Kevin kind of ruled the roost. And it was okay with some guys. It wasn't as, as, as okay with some of the other guys. And, and Ray was one of the guys who really had his own routine that he necessarily wanted to follow. So, um, you know, the, the real rift seems to be between Rajon Rondo and, and Ray. At least the, Rajon's become the spokesperson for the other side. Um, but John, I, I was in New Orleans the other night, and, and John said that he may try to call Ray on the phone and see if he can work this stuff out. So uh, I'd like to see it happen because, you know, we're, we're coming up on a 10-year anniversary of that team, and it would be a shame if you, uh, you couldn't have all three of those guys together, uh, yeah. or four of those guys, count, counting Rajon, um, in any kind of, you know, ceremony or thing that you would do. Uh, I'd hate to see some petty stuff mess that up because that was a that was a really fun team to do and that was uh that was the highlight of my broadcasting career was just doing that that season with those guys they were they just were so much fun to be around so that was your favorite team so, oh without well, question yeah but again, but again chris because you know i i might have been one of the, the larry bird teams if i had traveled with them but as you know uh, you get to know guys and you get to make friends, establish relationships with guys on the road. You don't yep. necessarily do it at home. When you're doing home games, everybody's coming from their home. And as soon as the game's over, they're kind of anxious to get back to their home. Um, whereas when you're on the road, you're getting on buses, you're checking in the hotels at three or four o'clock in the morning, you're scraping snow off your car, hands from Air Force Base at 3 a.m. Um, you get to know people a lot better then. So uh, I was doing all the Celtic games when the championship 2008 team rolled around and uh you know i, I remember danny age you know not that danny runs things by me but i remember danny and i were somewhere and danny said mike if you had a chance to uh get kevin garnett would you give up al jefferson to which i said no really uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so th- 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 that was the last time danny consulted me on any of his potential deals <laughs> That's a great story. I, I I felt like that 2008 team, I thought that was an outstanding team. Um, I think that was – I actually feel like it's unfortunate that they didn't win more than one championship because I really think they were that good. I thought they should have got at least two. And, it, and, and, you know, the injuries, it was what injuries to Garnett, and then they traded Perk, and so – some of it was out of yeah. their hands, but what, what's your thought on that? Is on that team, how good they were? I agree. I, I think if Perk didn't get hurt, we would have won two championships. Yeah. Um, and uh, the thing I loved about that team most, Chris, was was uh, two things. One, you and I saw it before anybody else because when we saw them play in London in the preseason that year, and and we saw what Kevin Garnett was going to do in terms of energizing this group. I think all of us walked out of that first preseason game in London going like, yeah, I know this is the preseason, but wow, these yeah. guys could be special if they play like this every night. And they did. And the the thing is in traveling with them is I loved about them is they, they loved playing on the road as much and more than they loved playing at home. They wanted to go into your building and beat you up. Um, and they, they came in with that kind of attitude every night. Uh, they were a great road team. Um, and they were, they were just fun to be around. You know, it was a, I, I, I felt that year like I was a kid in that movie, almost famous. You know, I just was, <laughs> I was kind of along. I was along for the ride. What was? I'm sure you got some great Garnett stories about his intensity. I heard one that when he he had left Boston and was playing for the Nets, and he was sitting out a practice because I don't know if he was injured a little bit or they just wanted to give him a rest. But he was. They were scrimmaging in practice. And they wouldn't let him scrimmage because they just wanted to rest him. So he is literally, as the team scrimmaging, they say he was running up and down the sidelines with the flow of the action, yelling stuff, yeah. you know, encouragement, what to do, just basically coaching the guys and encouraging them throughout the scrimmage and running up and down the court. Did you see that type of intensity? And do you have any stories kind of that show how intense and how great of a leader Garnett was? Well, he was a, he was a great leader. He was the best. And, and you know, this is hard to say with, with, from a guy who did most of Larry Bird's career, if not all of Larry Bird's career broadcasting. Uh, I, I think Kevin was probably the best teammate that I've ever seen 
a, a team have. I mean, he, he just organized everything. He, he did tend to micromanage a little bit, but that's, that's kind of how he was. He was, he was probably told you where to sit in the plane, what, what you were supposed to do, what you weren't <laughs> supposed to do. Um, but again, as a teammate, he was a great teammate and, uh, it was on the court. And, and when I say on the court, I'm not even talking about just simply the game. I'm talking about the whole, the practice, the day of the game the, 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 he just, as soon as he got on the plane, or, or, or he was he was Kevin Garnett, and this was Kevin Garnett's bunch. And uh, you, you remember when he was doing the press conferences early on when he first came to Boston, um, he insisted that Ray and, and Paul always be on the uh, podium with him. Yep. Uh, so there, it was always the three of them, you know. And it was uh, it was like watching The Godfather all over again. These were the three <laughs> sons that were up there. <laughs> Red was the godfather, and uh, these were the guys who were going to win the championships for him, and they, and they did, and they should have, not should have, but they could have won two. I'm convinced if Perk had never got hurt, they would have won a second championship, and uh, that that was again the most, I won't say the most fun team I've been around because that would sound like I participated in stuff with them off the court, and I really didn't do that, but in, in terms of once you walked into the arena, uh, you know when you're the when you're the play-by-play guy for for an NBA team, you you do feel like you're part of the team. Yeah. Uh, and when you're going through a stretch like you went through in the '90s, um, it, it, that was a tough job because you were getting your ass handed to you every night. <laughs> um, but it, it, it became a lot different when Kevin showed up, uh, and we were the ones who were handing out the punishment. That was a lot. Of, that after a lot of years in the '90s, that was that was really a lot of uh, a lot of fun. This is a tough question, but can you compare that 08 Celtics team to some of those great Bird, Mikhail Parrish teams? Well, you know, it, it, it's funny. All the good things I just said, I, if they played each other in the series, I'd probably take the Bird, Mikhail Parrish group to win the series. Uh, I think it would be stretched out, but I think they would win the series. Um, you know, Chris, you and I, it was such a different game then. You know, the basketball has really changed a lot in the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, Robert Parrish, I don't know if Robert Parrish plays a whole lot today the way Robert played uh, because of the way the game has changed. Um, Kevin McHale would have to become a three-point shooter uh, to, to be a factor in today's game. So it, I guess it depends upon what, whether you allow hand-checking yeah. and, and whether how much, how much the three-point line is a factor in the game. But... Uh, I would I would give an edge to the to the bird team simply because I mean Larry was I forget sometimes how good Larry was and I and I flip on some of these old shows highlight shows of him and I realize wow there there aren't many if any guys who are doing what he's doing today uh, and play the game as completely as he played it and to be surrounded by what three four other Hall of Famers uh, that's as good as the OA team was those are credentials they can't really match. Yeah, I hear, you know, especially younger guys, um, you know, they'll hear about Larry Bird or look at some of the highlights and think, oh, he couldn't play. He couldn't do that today because of the athleticism or whatever. And I'm like, first of all, guys were athletic back then, too. (laughs) And secondly, (laughs) he would be able to get it done. I mean, he was so great. Seeing it up close. Were you? Did you ever marvel about a guy that, you know, didn't have the great speed or jumping ability? But how he was just obviously just incredible and was able to play better than these guys who might have been a lot more athletic. Yeah, he, you know, nobody worked like he did. You know, I, I can remember very clearly uh, we started the game time would be like 730 in Boston and about 430 in the afternoon. I'd show up at the old Boston Garden and they, they used to you remember the old Boston Garden just because of the. The circus, they used to have ramps. There wasn't yeah. stairways that you went up to get in. It was all these ramps you walked up and down so they could get the elephants or whatever in and out. <laughs> um, and I can remember I'd be walking up that ramp and I'd hear, I'd hear a ball hitting the court. Uh, and it knew, the noise would get louder and louder the closer I got to the court. And by the time I get in, it, again, about four thirty, three hours before the game, there was Larry out there with, with uh, Corky, who used to be his guy on the team, <laughs> uh, on the training staff. And he was out there shooting, and he was very much like, like, like Kyrie. I watched Kyrie do warmups, and Kyrie does these funny little bank shots and throws up these little left-handed things when he's working out. And that's the same way Larry was. Larry worked on what I would call funny-looking shots, and then all of a sudden, when the opportunity presented itself in the game, you go, "Oh my God, that's the shot he was practicing three hours ago when I walked in here." Um, and, but instead, he's doing it in the face of somebody throwing up a left-hander high off the glass for two. So. 
Um, Larry, Larry could play in any game, anywhere, in any era, and be, if not the best, one of the best players on the court, one of the top two players on the court. He, he just had an understanding of the game that was beyond everybody else um, who played it. He, he didn't go, he wasn't big on handshaking with other guys. He wasn't big on greeting, hugging guys on the opposite team. Mm-hmm. He came out and he did his job. And, and he, he, you know, I, I know this sounds kind of obvious, but he, as soon as he stepped across the line, he was playing the game. You know, it did, he, it, he wasn't waiting for the whistle to be blown to play the game. As soon as he stepped across the line on the court, he was playing the game. And that's why he was able to do some things to guys uh, that uh, other people couldn't. And I'll, I'll always have that image in my mind of the guys on the Atlanta bench the night that Larry scored 60. Uh, the guys on the Atlanta bench were literally high-fiving themselves on birds' baskets uh, wow. because he, was put, he, put on, he put on such a show. You watch the end of the game. And the guys, he, he had a three from in front of the Atlanta bench and the entire Atlanta bench just collapsed. They just <laughs> collapsed and fell down. <laughs> because, um, and it, the great story about that was that nine days previously, Kevin McHale had scored 56 against uh, Kent Benson. And, and I think he was playing for Detroit at the time. And that was the Celtics all-time record. And, and Bird said to him after the game, he said, enjoy it because I'm going to go get 60 in the next week or two here. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and got 69 days, nine days later, scored 60 against Atlanta to break Kevin's record. And, and to this day, Larry would tell you, he said, I told Kevin, you should, you should have gone for like 65 or so. Cause like, as soon as you said it, I was like, Oh, I'm not letting him have the record. And, and he did let him have it. Had it for nine days. That was it. Wow. What what was their relationship like, McHale and Bird, when they were playing? They were a great bunch. You know, I did do I did do some traveling with them and, and again that was that was before the days of the charter. So, you know, that that was really a grind because you would play a game in Richfield, Ohio or somewhere at the old Richfield Coliseum and you would go back to a hotel and stay overnight and get up to the wake up call it would be like four or five in the morning because the NBA rule was you had to be on the first plane out to your next destination to play the game the following night. And you'd get on a seven o'clock plane and get to Chicago at like nine thirty or ten in the morning and, and take a bus to the hotel and get out and play again. Mm. Uh, that was a grind. That was really a grind. And those guys, you had to have a sense of humor and you had to be to happen. The Celtics used to have a routine. Uh, again, these are the pre-security days. Uh, so the, the, the guys in the media in the local city that we were going to, when you walked off the plane, they were literally standing right there at the end of the, uh, the uh, passageway looking to, to do with you. So the Celtics used to sell, send ML Carr off the plane first. Uh, and, and ML used to go out and greet everybody like, Hey guys, how are you? Come on. What do you need to know? And, and then all of a sudden, like Larry and Kevin and chief would like slink behind them and like, <laughs> you try to get by, get by the gauntlet while ML who was, uh, very good at that was able to attract their attention. Um, uh, but yeah, they were, they were a good group. Danny was, it was a part of that team. Um, Dennis Johnson, God bless his soul was, it was a really good solid player for that basketball team. I mean, that they had quality at every position and, uh, and had arguably along with magic, of course, uh, one of the three best players in the game. Uh, this was actually before Michael came. So one of the two best players in the game, magic and, and Larry were special. They saved the NBA. No, a lot of people think. Yeah. What, obviously it was birds team, but what kind of leader was he? I don't, I don't think he was like that much of a vocal leader. What kind of leader was he? No, he wasn't. He led by example. He, he just, he led by example. He set a standard both in practice and in, in games and playing hard and, 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 and playing the right way. Uh, he, he reminds me, it's interesting. They're both in the same neck of the woods. Uh, you hear, hear Brad Stevens say that all the time. Like, you know, uh, make the right play, make the right basketball play. That's all I'm really asking you to do. And uh, you watch Brad, and sometimes when the ball is moving around the court, two passes before the shot is actually made, you'll see Brad clapping his hands because cause the, the guys are doing it the way it should be done. That's the way Larry was. Larry understood the game and wanted to play the way it should be done, and he just got everybody else to follow his suit. Um, again, he was a remarkable player to watch uh, night in, night out uh, with the things that he would do. Again, he, you, you see him out there at 4.30 in the afternoon and he's throwing up left-handed hooks from, you know, 
13, 14 feet to the left side of the basket. You're going, why are you practicing that? And then all of a sudden he gets double team and he spins out of a double team late in the game. And there's suddenly that left-handed hook is going in the basket. You know, oh, okay. <laughs> 4.30 this afternoon, 4.30 this afternoon, he figured out I'm going to need this shot against these guys because they do this <laughs> or that. Uh, he was just, uh, again, it's, I, I know it's a, it's a cliche, but most of the guys were playing checkers. He was playing chess yeah, yeah. when he played. He, of course, had that famous quote about Jordan. I think it was after Jordan scored 63 on them in the playoffs, and he yes. said uh, yes. it, it was God disguised as Michael Jordan. What was your <laughs> impression when you first saw I Michael Jordan? I did that Jordan? game, actually. It was that game? Oh, you did that. Okay. I, yeah. What What was your impression, well, not, I, not just from that game, but when you first saw Jordan – come into the league like was it kind of did you feel like it was something you had never seen before yeah I was I was actually surprised how good he was because again he was kind of restrained for lack of a better way to put it in North Carolina's system so I mean he was a very good player in North Carolina don't get me wrong but I didn't think he was going to be Michael Jordan when he when he came into the league yeah um I but but uh yeah he he he, right away you knew he was he was you said earlier, and I agree with you, that the, the guys back in those days were athletes, and they were. Um, but but Michael was much more today's athlete. Yeah. Uh, he was he was he was special physically. The things he was able to do. Uh, the uh, you know the great players, Chris. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. The, the great players slow the game down. They they make the game play at their pace. You know, the game can be played at any pace at all, but then the ball hits LeBron's hands, the ball hits Larry's hands, the ball hits Michael's hands, and all of a sudden it's like everything comes to an instant stop and then proceeds at the pace they want it to go at. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's the way Larry was. That's the kind of teammate he was. That's the way he, he, he led by example. And, um, the, you know, they were, they were just a good bunch around. Kevin was the intellectual of the group. Kevin McHale was the guy who read the books on the plane. Um, you know, that was another thing, too, Chris. I'm getting off the subject here. But that was another thing that was fascinating in those days is sometimes we'd fly on planes where there were only six or eight first-class seats. So um, it, you you haven't seen anything because you've seen, like, Robert Parrish in a middle seat and coach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I heard that they determined it. Was it seniority determined who got in the first class? It wasn't, like, who's the better players, necessarily. Uh <laughs> It was kind of like Larry got there, and um, then everybody kind of followed suit. That was the way it was with, with Kevin, although we were flying in the charter in those days. And it didn't matter. <laughs> you know, uh, La- Larry got to sit where Larry wanted to sit. Larry was then, always um, first class. <laughs> yeah, 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 Larry was always, yeah, Larry was always first class. The coaches sometimes get kicked out of first class. In fact, most of the time they get kicked out of first class. Wow. But uh, I, I remember very distinctly we would fly that it was like an eighth uh, – 15 seater somewhere on going from Milwaukee to Chicago or something like that. And, uh, I'll just me- me- remember seeing Robert Parrish sitting in the middle seat and coach. And <laughs> they oh, knew were two people who were just your ordinary businessmen or, or whatever next to him. Um, and on either side of them, they just, they didn't know what to think. What to do. <laughs> That's incredible. I mean, we can't even fathom that today with these guys flying charter and you know what I mean? It's unbelievable. Oh, it's, not, it's a to- totally different life. Totally yeah. different life. I mean, but it, 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 it's a totally different life, but it's not a whole lot easier. I mean, it, the road is still really a grind, and, and, and it wears on people after a while, um, and it wears on the uh, level of play uh, because uh, we're, we're going out on a road trip on Thursday where we're uh, going to Portland, which is not a place you really want to, be, want to go right now mm-hmm. the way they're playing. Um, and then we have, then we go to Sacramento and Phoenix and Utah. Three games. We have four games, I think, in six nights. And you, you know how Utah is playing right now, and you know how Portland's playing right now. That's going to be a difficult trip with all the injuries that the Celtics have right now. So yeah, the, the travel, the travel can be a real grind, uh, even though people on the outside say, "Oh, you have this wonderful world of charter and stuff like that." It's, it's still no fun getting on a bus in the middle of a snowstorm in, in, in Chicago at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, that's not that's not any fun at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> speaking of this this current Celtics team, obviously, you know LeBron James has ruled the East for 
what, seven straight years. Um, and a lot of people just feel like, you know, you give him the benefit of the doubt, they're going to win the East. I, you said back in November you don't – this Cavs team will not uh, even make the Eastern Conference Finals. Obviously they've had some trades since then. Uh, where, where do you stand on that now? What's your kind of thoughts on the Eastern Conference playoffs and how they could play out? I think it's going to be a struggle for Cleveland to get there. I still do. Um, I, I wish we were healthier if we get, end up getting Cleveland in the second round, uh, if we get to the second round right now, but we're not very healthy at all. So, um, but I, I still think Cleveland's got their work cut out to themselves to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. I, I think Toronto is for real. Um, I don't think this is the, you know, people say, oh, Toronto's been like this before and then they fade in the playoffs. This is a different team. Uh, it's still Lowry and it's still DeRozan, but they got a lot of other people who can play uh, and play hard. Uh, and Casey's doing a great coaching job up there. So I think Toronto's going to be a very, they've shown they can beat Houston. They can beat very good teams. Um, I think Toronto's the odds-on favorite to get to the Eastern Conference uh, Finals and probably to get to represent the East in uh, the championship finals. But um, there are some other teams that are going to be tough outs. I think Philadelphia is going to be a tough out coming to playoffs when Embiid can play every night with a day off in between. Um, I think Phil, I think Indianapolis, Indiana rather, is better than people think. Oladipo's having a great year. Um, they, uh, Nate McMillan's done a really good job with that team. I think they're going to be a tough out. Um, I, Milwaukee, I know, is struggling right now, but you still got – uh, the Greek freak to deal with, and you know he, he can he can turn a game around all by himself. So I, I just think the Eastern Conference playoffs are going to be much more competitive than uh, than people think. And I think Cleveland. I'm not saying they won't get there. I I do like the trade. They got Kevin Love back last night, and that certainly helped. Um, I, I I still maintain LeBron's the best player in the league, um, and so he's going to be very difficult to out right now. The way he's playing, he's starting to put triple doubles up. He's getting ready for his playoff run. He looks like he's in just great shape. He doesn't look worn out at all from the season. Um, and I, I think he's continues to make a statement that he's maybe the best player of all time, which I get a lot of grief here in the city of Boston, but he's the best player I've ever seen. I know that. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, he's, it's amazing his longevity, too, the way he's been able to, to keep up the way he's playing. Um so you mentioned the injuries with the Celtics earlier. Um, do you think there's – I mean, I know Danny or Brad, Brad Stevens, I think, said that Gordon Hayward will not be back this season. What's your? Do you yeah. think he might, or you, you, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I've gotten a lot of trouble around <laughs> the city of Boston on that one. Um, I, yeah, people, I think he might be back, and here's why I think he might be back. Because uh, he's working very, very hard right now. He's working eight, nine hours a day. People tell me all the time. He's trying to get through as, as all the stages he has to go through in, in the mapped out recovery process as quickly as he can. If if Gordon didn't think in the back of his mind, I can still play this year, if he thought his next basketball game was going to be next October, um, I don't think you would see – I won't say the effort because it's difficult to put the effort, but I don't think you would see the de- degree of dedication in his working out if, if he didn't believe in, in somewhere in his heart of hearts that like, I can come back and help this team this year. So, um, you know, as much as Brad looks at me like, why are you saying stuff like that? I'm just <laughs> saying I, I, I have no information here. I'm not talking to Gordon on the sly. I'm not getting stuff from the medical. I'm just saying I'm watching from the outside and I'm seeing a guy who is just working his tail off eight to 10 hours a day to get back. And I think I, I see him walking around. He seems to be moving very well. I know he's not doing a lot of serious running and basketball stuff right now, but if he walked into a room right now, you would say, you wouldn't say that guy's got any issues at all. Um, so I, I just, I think there's a chance, especially if the Celtics can get through the first round of the playoffs, which I think is going to be a struggle. Um, I, I think there's a chance we might see him. I'm not saying we're going to see him. I think there's a chance we might see him. Danny would tell me I'm crazy. Uh, coach looks at me and just shakes his head. But um, <laughs> I, just, I just think there's a chance. How far do you think this Celtics team can go this year? I mean, with, I guess, with Hayward, without him, whatever, but, you know. I, I, I think Brad is going to be tested uh, 
severely uh, in terms of his coaching, which I think he'll respond very well because I think he's a brilliant coach. I think he's the Harry Potter of the NBA as far as mm. coaching goes. Um, but Marcus Smart, he, the loss of Marcus Smart really hurts us. Uh, Marcus brings a toughness and a determination to the game when he's in it that is contagious. And when he's not on the court to be that leader, it's extremely hard to replace him. Um, he he makes one, two, three plays a week that just turn your head. They don't show up in any column in the box score. It's either slipping a screen, it's it, it's it's go it's diving for a loose ball, and instead of calling timeout, which ninety percent of the guys in the league do when they dive for a loose ball, if they get their hands on it, Marcus is looking to make a pass from a lying down position, and is very successful at doing it. Um, Again, I think he's a key part of our team that we're missing, and that's going to be a real problem come playoff time. You know, the Celtics right now, uh, you could make an argument that their go-to guy is uh, is Jason Tatum, uh, mm. who just turned 20 years old in his, his, in his rookie season. Um, Jalen Brown going down with a concussion. He hasn't come back from that yet. I hear he's doing well in the NBA's protocol, but that's taken him a while to get back. You don't know how he's going to react to that long-term um, I think a lot of negative things have happened for the Celtics of late. If, if I had talked to you a month ago, I would have told you I thought they're an Eastern Conference Finals team in, in the hunt to go to the NBA Finals. Now, getting through that second round is going to be very difficult if there's no Hayward and there's no Marcus Smart and uh, Jalen Brown's not playing up to 100%. And, you know, the, uh, the people would have thought you really were on drugs if I told you that if, Daniel Tice not being in the lineup is going to be a blow for the Celtics. <laughs> but uh, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel Tice turned out to be a very good player for us off the bench uh, and gave us size, gave us some of that toughness I was talking about that Marcus brings. Uh, and we miss him. We, we miss him a lot. Uh, so I, I think we're undermanned going into the playoffs. You know, the, we can't complain about that because when you look around the league, so many big time players right now, as you and I speak, are, are injured. Um, and it could really affect the, uh, both the Western Conference and the Eastern Conference. But uh, what, what, what looked to me like a, a very doable road to the Eastern Conference Finals for the Celtics now is going to be a real challenge for them, especially if they get into the second round. You mentioned some of the young talent, <clears throat> Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. Obviously, hey, we're coming back at some point, if not this year, next year. Do you think this is the core, Kyrie Irving, obviously, of – a championship team. I mean, you've you've covered the league so long. You know what a championship team looks like. Do you think they have that core now, or does Danny I, need to use some of his other a- assets that he has to, you know, make it even better? Well, um, I think they do have the core to win it right now. I think if you have any chance to get Anthony Davis, <laughs> you completely reevaluate your thinking as to who your core is because yeah. if suddenly Anthony Davis is going to become part of your core, you're going to have to give up a lot. Uh, you're going to have to consider giving up the Browns and the Tatums of the world. Yeah. Um, but, but that said, if you can't get an Anthony Davis, I think the Celtics are very comfortable going to battle with a healthy group they have right now. And, and they still got a bunch of number one draft picks piled up here that they can use. Um, so, yeah, I think they do have the base in place to be a very good team for the next four or five years. Um, but again, it shows you what injuries can do. Injuries can really wreak havoc on a team and make you second guess the approach uh, that you're taking. I think the Celtics are pretty firm in, in what they want to do. I, again, I think if they thought they had a chance to get an Anthony Davis, I think they're right in that discussion. But uh, I, you could probably forget counting on one hand. You could count on two or three fingers, the number of guys they're willing to radically change their current plan to get Anthony Davis would be one. I'm not even sure who the others would be. Uh, but, uh, I was, I, Anthony's just so fresh in my mind because he torched us for 45 in Boston <laughs> and then torched us again, he torched us again the other night in New Orleans. And, you know, he, he's another one of those guys, you know, LeBron is like that. Uh, Chris, we're privileged and, and lucky that we get to get really good seats. So we really get to see these guys yeah. close up. And, and you, you can see when a LeBron or an Anthony Davis is on the floor, they're just going to dominate the game. And, and uh, Kevin Durant is on the floor. You, they're they're, they're, they're going to dominate the game, and they're going to play the game the way they want to play it, and there's really not much you can do about it. Um, but, again, aside from guys like that, like LeBron and, and, and Durant and Davis, 
Otherwise, I think the Celtics stay put with what they have and, and feel pretty good about it. How special do you feel like Kyrie Irving is? I mean, is there anything you've seen that surprised you about him? He's, he's a special offensive player. He's as gifted an offensive player as I think I've ever seen um, because he has that ridiculous handle uh, that can get him to places. And, and again, I watch, him, I watch him work out. I'm fascinated by his pregame workouts about two hours, uh, an hour before people are in the building. Uh, the stuff he practices, he practices those little floaters and flip shots and stands out there and is taking left-handed shots up to, uh, that go off the corner of the glass that you wonder, when's he going to use that? And then it's very much like I was talking about Bird earlier. You, all of a sudden in the game, there it is, and, he, and he's using it. Uh, so he's, he's a gifted offensive player. I'm, I'm concerned about the nagging problems he seems to be having with his knee. Uh, but... Uh, Kyrie can take you a long way. There's no question about that. And if he's healthy, um, he's shown that, that, that in, in big moments, he's, he's more than willing to not only take the shots, but make the shots. So um, you throw in Tatum, you throw in Brown, you throw in Hayward, uh, you throw in Al Horford, who I think is an underrated player. People get on his case around here in Boston because they think he's supposed to get 25 points and 18 rebounds a game. That's not who he is. Um, but but who he is is a very very good a teammate, but very very good player. Who the, if you run the ball to him, he will make the right quote basketball decision ninety nine percent of the time. Um, so yeah, I think the Celtics feel like they have the pieces that they need to win. Um, and uh, you know, it was it's obviously a shame what happened to Gordon. But if, if Gordon comes back at a hundred percent and LeBron's a year older next year. Uh, the Celtics and Toronto so will, will be the two teams that people talk about in the East. I'm going to take you on a trip down memory lane. Oh! Oh! Send it in, Jerome! Send it <laughs> <Okay>. in, Jerome! <laughs> I think I did a terrible oh, yeah. Bill Raftery uh, impression, <laughs> but you were calling yeah. that game with him when Jerome Lane broke the backboard. Uh, what are your memories yeah. from, from that moment? My first memory from that moment was it was like those old Snickers commercials. We're going to be here a while <laughs> uh, because, um, you know, people didn't have extra backboards floating around. That they could wheel out and throw up. Like, um, so that was my first. Time. We had uh, Johnny Nelson uh, came over and talked to us for like 35 minutes uh, to fill time. Um, I, I the, the Big East was a really great experience to me. I, I mean, I, I feel like arguably I had as good a job uh, as anybody in basketball through the, the uh, 80s and, and, and 90s because I would, I would do the Celtics, with, 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 and especially in the 80s, I would do the Celtics on three nights a week where they never lost at home, and, and Larry was putting on shows every single night. And then when the Celtics would go on the road, I'd go do Syracuse at Georgetown or or mm. St. John's and, 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 and Seton Hall and Madison Square Garden in front of 20,000 people. I can remember going to doing Georgetown and Syracuse where there's, what, 28,000 people in the carrier dome. So um, I, was, I was really, there was a period there, Chris, where I was doing sometimes eight games a week because I'd do, I'd do two games on Saturday. I'd do a Big East regional game at noontime. And then I'd drive to like Seton Hall or St. John's or some places and do a game that, on Saturday night and come back and do the Celtics on Sunday. Um, but it, you never got tired of it. Um, and, and even, again, there were great moments like your own lane breaking the backboard. But I can remember in the Big East tournament, there were wonderful, wonderful moments there. Um, it, was, it was a great basketball life I had going for myself. Because, again, I saw, the, I saw the Big East when it was at its absolute peak yep. and, and saw the Celtics when they were at, at their peak. So, uh, the, you know, people think you're a good broadcaster if your team wins games. I think you're a bad broadcaster if your team loses games. So <laughs> I, I was a great, I was a great broadcaster during. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great stuff. That's great stuff. Um, one last thing: my producer is a huge Celtics fan. He's probably the biggest Al Horford fan on the planet. Um, but he he yeah. put together five Tommy Heinsohn related rapid fire questions. Uh, that I they're they're specifically okay. geared geared for lifelong Celtics fans. So I want to hit you with okay. those real quick. Fire away. All right. What's the angriest you've ever seen Tommy Heinsohn at officials? 
we had this, uh, this Tommy was probably, this was probably 15 years ago. Tommy's, uh, 82, I think right now, 83. So Tommy was in his late sixties, maybe 70. Uh, I forget who the official was, but Tommy went after him in the corridor after the game. Uh, and we had, to, we had to separate them, physically separate them. <laughs> um, and, it, it, and you know, you haven't seen anything because you've seen like a six, eight, 70 year old guy taking on a 55 year old guy who's not in great shape. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that, that was, uh, that was really something. Cause I, we Did he, he actually got to the official? The oh yeah. Yeah. No, we're at, we're walking down the corridor after the game and, uh, the official was, was coming out of, uh, had, had you know changed clothes and showered and was about to leave and he, he was coming out in the you know in the garden it's all down that corridor the officials room the, the yep. team room the media room they're all off in one corridor there and the guy comes out the door and Tommy said something to him and the guy said something back and next thing I know Tommy's going over me after him uh, <laughs> and uh, they had to physically get the cops in there to separate them it was just, it was a scene wow. it was a scene so that that would be but what Tommy does which is, is he he baits the officials I mean. He waits until the official is running by our broadcast position uh, and gets close, and that's when he goes off on some of his rants <laughs> uh, to make sure that the guy can hear it on the way on the way by. Yeah. But but a lot of the guys, Ken, Kenny Mauer, Tony Brothers, um, they, they have they have figured it out, and and the way to figure it out is come over and pay the guy a little respect. I mean, he, he's a guy who won eight championships, I think, as a player and two more as a coach. Um, he does know what he's talking about. Yep. They might not like what he says, but he does know what he's talking about. That's a long answer to a rapid fire question. I no, but I that's, that's great. That's great. All right. So besides Walter McCarty, who is Tommy's favorite player of all time? Paul Pierce. Pierce. Okay. Here's a quick answer for him. Yeah. yeah. Paul Pierce. See, Tommy's the one who said that again, if you, uh, considering Larry and, and the people that have played for the Celtics through the years, uh, John Havlicek, you can go on and on. Uh, to say like in five seconds to go in the game, who's hand, who's who would you put the ball, give the ball to to win the game? Without his hesitation, Tommy says Paul Pierce. Wow. Wouldn't what would your answer to that be? Paul Pierce. Really? Over Bird? Yeah. Yeah, because it, yeah, um, yeah, because because yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm trying to think of why, uh, because Larry can, can, can do most of the same things. But but Paul Paul was an excellent free throw shooter. Had had a brilliant in between game of 15 to 18 feet for pull up jump shots and could shoot threes. Um, so the, he was he was really a triple threat that way, and he and he could take it to the basket. Probably that's where he had an edge on Larry. And he could take it to the basket with real physical authority. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I would. All due respect to Larry, I would give the ball to Paul and take my chances. Wow, what was your reaction when Tommy made the Greg Steamsma, Bill Russell comparison? <laughs> <laughs> you just heard it right there. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I just I, I tried to laugh off camera. Uh, I sometimes uh, there's, there's a lot of things with Tommy that I've done where I. I when Tommy says something that it's just completely off the wall uh, or, or, or goes after the, the officials in a way that I prefer not to be included, I just do a silent Ken count in my head before I say anything because I, I, I'm just going like, they're going to have to struggle to find me on this tape. When they try to play. <laughs> uh, all right, explain. Now, Tommy, he, he gave your career a big boost because he went to bat for you to call Celtics games. Yeah, that's true. Tommy... Um, I was in Providence, Rhode Island, um, doing six and 11 o'clock newscasts as a sports guy. And part of the deal that, that, that the local station channel 12 had, at the time in Providence had with Providence college was that they had five games a year that they would, they would televise locally. And, um, when I got the job as the Monday to Friday guy, along with it came the job as the play by play guy for those five games. And we're in a meeting one day and, uh, they said, well, we got to try to find somebody to, do color and the name and all these obscure ex province college players. And I said, why don't we just get Tommy Hudson? And they said, Oh, Tommy Hudson will never want to do the game. And I said, well, let's give it a shot. And Chris, this is a good indication. You and I can fully appreciate as to how things have changed. I called the Boston garden and got the switchboard. And I said, uh, 
office, have the Celtics office, please. And then somebody picks the phone and says, good morning, Boston Celtics. And I said, yeah, uh, can I get Tommy Heinsohn's phone number? And the person goes, sure, just a moment, and, and gives me his phone number. So yeah. then I called Tommy at home and identified myself. At, in, I, we've never met. I said, Tom, I, I'm working in Providence, Rhode Island. I could find PC games that I need a color guy for. Are you interested? He goes, absolutely. So that's, that's how I going on 42 year relationship wow. started now. Wow. Wow. Last one. It's a bonus one. Do you remember calling Bonzi <laughs> Wells a budget Paul Pierce years ago? <laughs> no, really? Please, I, please erase that tape. <laughs> <laughs> that was from the that. producer. No. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do our a, best a to budget, find a, and erase a budget it. Paul Pierce, Bonzi Wells. Well, it depends upon what kind of budget you were on. If you you were on some of the budgets I was on in college days and stuff like that, maybe. (laughs) Well, Mike, it's been great. We appreciate your time. Um, Outstanding interview. And and keep doing a great job with the uh, Celtics. Um, You're going to be doing this for a lot longer, I imagine. I got I got no future plans that don't include them, Chris. Great, great, great. That's good for all of us. So, thanks a lot, man, and uh, I'll see you down the road in the playoffs. Great talking to you, Chris. Take all right, care. Mike. See you.